All right, people are catching up. They're coming onto the live stream. Uh, very informal introduction for not a topic that I can turn. I can turn most topics into messing around material. This one is tricky. But we're talking about Kashmir with uh, Murtaza Hussein. He's a reporter and columnist for The Intercept, one of the most important voices in international affairs, Middle East, South Asia, good friend of mine. Murtaza, thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me. So, Murtaza, briefly, I guess, can you give us the sweep here? What has India done in Kashmir? Uh, and how does this flow back to the history of independence from the United Kingdom from the British Empire in 1947 and partition with Pakistan. So when the British Empire uh, was unwinding and it was leaving India, uh, it became, as you mentioned, a partition of the subcontinent into a separate nation of India and Pakistan. Now, Kashmir was an unsettled uh, dispute, or the territory, the state, was its status was left ambiguous at the time of Britain's withdrawal. Uh, presumably, uh, what the intention was in the, at the beginning was that Kashmir at some point would have a referendum in which the people who live there would decide either they would have a vote on whether to either accede to India, accede to Pakistan, or become an independent nation on their own. Because Kashmir is about 12 million people. It has a very strong uh, independent consciousness and identity, a very unique place. Now, over the years, uh, there, there was intended to be a vote that had to decide this question. They kept getting kicked down the road by subsequent Indian leaders, uh, certain Kashmiri leaders who had either worked with India or Pakistan on the Indian side, some of them found themselves uh, later on detained or coming, calling out with uh, Nehru, who was the uh, first post-colonial prime minister of India. And eventually, ultimately, the vote never happened. And then if you fast forward to the 80s, political agitation kept building up, and then there broke out a protest movement in the streets, and it was met with violence, and then that resulted in armed insurgency. And then by the early 90s, Kashmir was in a full-blown war. And that war has never really ended to this day. It's said on and on and off, but it's been one of the deadliest conflicts in the world. It has gotten relatively little coverage for the seriousness of it. About seventy to 80,000 people have been killed in Kashmir since the war there broke out. And uh, so the last vestige of this presumed autonomy of Kashmir was what India moved to take away in the last few days. There was an article of the Indian Constitution, Article 370, which described in Kashmir's relation to India and preserved some degree of autonomy over the years that practical effects of that have been grounded down. But most crucially, there was one segment of it, that article, which is called, referred to as 35A, which allowed the Kashmiri state government to decide who is or is not a resident of Kashmir. Now that article has been revoked, theoretically, and what many people in Kashmir fear, feel now, fear now is that the 1.2 billion population of India will now start being settled in Kashmir and ultimately create a settler colonial dynamic in so the region. So this could be like similar. a Tibet or West Bank kind of situation? Exactly. Uh, using demographic changes to uh, alter the real, political reality in Kashmir. And the thing is, with the West Bank, people make that comparison a lot. But I've been to the West Bank and I've talked to people about this. The thing is, uh, Israelis are not that many numerous. So they've had control of the West Bank for 50 plus years, uh, but they've still amount to a very small minority of the population. Whereas China, because they're such a huge population, they're able to completely subsume Tibet uh, with their population. And India is much more likely to have that type of scenario. They can swamp Kashmir with people very quickly. And... Because of all the bloodshed that's happened in the last few decades, there are very few people, people in Kashmir are very bitter, and they're, they're, those voices were conciliatory towards India, 
we're becoming fewer and fewer, and now those people are actually in jail because because in the midst of this uh, move, there's been a total crackdown in Kashmir. All communication has been cut off, and the state government, which is pro India as long as they have some autonomy and um, relatively moderate on the question of India, are now all in prison. So when we talk, I just I want to actually get back to Nehru and really the contested idea of India in a minute. But the other dimension that I've heard referenced uh, to, me, uh, to me, and I'll, I'll cite specifically Esha in our audience, who also has a really good uh, podcast called Historically, which I really hope I'm not messing up. It's a very smart podcast. And there's this dim almost analogy with a place like uh, Puerto Rico in terms of the colonial relationship with the United States and Puerto Rico. And that if you strip away some of this sort of independence in Kashmir, not only does that have further implications, obviously, for some sense of autonomy, there's already very serious, as you said, I mean, the, the human rights violations in Kashmir from the Indian occupation, as well as the Pakistani role, which we'll get to in a minute, have been ongoing and horrific for decades. But that this also opens the door basically for it, you know, in some ways you could like a gentrification, a new, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, kind of economic class to come in, gentrify, create like a kind of new ski slope economy here as well, that there is kind of a primitive accumulation economics to this as well. That's right. Uh, and obviously, Kashmir's economy pales in comparison to India, uh, one fraction of this population of uh, India as a whole. And a lot of the way that the move has been justified internally, there hasn't really been a lot of effort to justify it, but what, what some uh, ruling party BJP leaders in India have said is that an opportunity to develop Kashmir economically by uh, allowing investment and so forth. But uh, certainly the people who are going to benefit from that are not going to be the indigenous people who are as a rule, completely opposed to being incorporated within India. Uh, it's going to likely be outside classes who benefit. And, yeah, it's, uh, I think that we're going to see very tightened levels of securitization uh, and control. And that's saying something, because Kashmir is commonly referred to as the most militarized place on Earth. There's over 600,000, between 500 and 600,000 uh, Indian troops stationed there in a place where only 12 million people lived. That's a soldier for, you know, it's a very, very high proportion of soldiers per people. And uh, you can probably see that escalating now. Because again, one where it plays that India has a decisive advantage is manpower. I want to talk, uh, you know, specifically, can we contrast, and, and again, I'm not saying, like, obviously, there's been a problem in terms of national policy from uh, the Indian government to Kashmir from the beginning. However, you know, and, and of course there's, you know, socialists and communists in India uh, who have a commitment to structural social justice and so on, have all sorts of problems with the Congress party. We know of the horrific record of Indira Gandhi's governments. We can don't go down the list, but it would be naive, I think, at least in my outside reading, to not see that the BJP, as exemplified under Modi and exemplified in this move, really is embodying a different India. And that Nehru, for all of the contradictions and all of the problems, really did have a certain vision of pluralism. I want to play this clip of Nehru that we have talking about India's tryst with destiny. And then, Murtaza, I'd like you to talk about the changing sort of concept of what India is relative to the Nehruian legacy, and maybe this is even like a kind of final rebuke of it. But first, here's a brief, brief clip of Nehru. Long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny, and now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge, not only or in full measure, but very substantially. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. 
Murtaza. Yes, uh, I think that what you said is very true. Uh, I think that what we're seeing now is the ultimate ugly logic of partition reaching its uh, ultimate conclusions. Over the past several decades, especially following the uh, uh, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and the war that began thereafter, Pakistan has developed a very sectarian Muslim character, which did not prevail during the early decades of the country. Uh, India, both countries were intended to be secular uh, by their founders. They were imprinted a very strong secular uh, and in some sense progressive uh, character upon them or intention upon them. Uh, But Pakistan has gone in a very different direction recently. And it seems India is going in that direction now too, uh, a few decades later. But the BJP government is thoroughly hostile to the Nehruvian vision of the country. They're hostile to the Congress party for some reasons which are poignant and some reasons which should be troubling to people who care about an inclusive society. And I think that the firm repudiation of Congress and the embrace of the BJP in the last election, even in the face of the slowing economy, shows just that they, their vision of the country is becoming mainstream. And I think it's a very deeply troubling vision. And the thing with India, too, is that it's an extremely diverse country. Uh, it, India, as a political unit, it has had tenuous existence throughout history. It coalesces during certain the rule of certain empires and then breaks into princely states. There's very strong regionalism. And that inclusive identity is very important to hold the country together because you have, there was an insurgency and a nationalist movement in Punjab and among Sikh population in the 80s, which was uh, crushed with military means. There's very strong regionalism in the South, Kerala. There is a Muslim population, which is about 15% of the population, but in actual numbers, it's hundreds of millions of people. Uh, so failing to have an inclusive vision, it, there, it's, good. it's a threat in a practical standpoint. It's a threat to the potential cohesion of India in the long term. And I think that as you see the Indian economy not reaching the very lofty goals that Modi set for it, He's continuing to double down on nationalism instead. And I've seen this in Turkey and other places. And the results ultimately are troubling. What about in the last couple of minutes? I mean, what about the Pakistani role in this? Uh, Pakistan has, you know, there, as in so many of the cases, there's the, the situation of people actually inside the occupation dealing with their own aspirations, oppression, uh, and and desires and so on, and then the Pakistanis have their own nationalist impulse, their own sort of humiliation about Bangladesh, where they committed their own you know genocide, I would say, in the early seventies, uh, and they've used they, they've they've certainly funded terrorist groups, they funded you know different types of areas as sort of like different um, as a kind of strategic pinprick on India in this sort of like ongoing tit for tat that in some ways defines Pakistan more than it defines India, though it defines India too. What is the Pakistani role in it? And has Imran Khan's response to this been at least relatively settling compared to what it could be maybe with another Pakistani leader? You know, one of the great misfortunes of Kashmiris is that their cause is often associated in the minds of the international community uh, with Pakistan. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, there's not a really high degree of awareness and knowledge of the circumstances of how the conflict came about. And as Pakistan's uh, misfortunes and uh, the errors and uh, egregious acts uh, have caused it to lose soft power and diplomatic standing, it somehow affects Kashmiris as well too because they're seen as associated. Although in reality, their cause is quite distinct. Now, Pakistan, there's two perceptions of, uh, two ways of how they perceive uh, the issue. And as you mentioned, Bangladesh, in the Pakistani military intelligence establishment, there's a very strong desire for revenge against India for uh, 
what they see as uh, their role in breaking apart the country in 1971 when East Pakistan became Bangladesh uh, following a very heinous war that took place there. They would very much like to break Kashmir off and settle the score in that sense. This is really more about their own interests than about Kashmiris. But then also, in if you go to Pakistan, the biggest refugee population, although Afghans are a very big population now too, has traditionally been Kashmiris. Uh, mm -hmm. They're all very well represented in the cities and elsewhere. And there is, it very touches people's national sentiments very closely. Besides the partition, uh, Kashmir is a repository of high culture generally. So the, it has a very important place in people's hearts. Now, Imran Khan, he came to power he, on a very optimistic vision, both economically and politically, and including the future of India's relations with Pakistan. And he's seen now, unfortunately, that uh, the reality in all those fronts is not as Panglossian as he laid out. He inherited, really, a very dysfunctional economy from his predecessor, Nawaz Sharif, he inherited a very difficult diplomatic position of Pakistan vis-a-vis -vis the world. And he's repeatedly said that the election of Modi would be good for Pakistan. But I think that underplays the changes that have happened in India that you mentioned early on. It's not the same India that existed 10, 15 years ago from a political standpoint. And the Modi government, uh, and if you watch Indian media, actually, anti-Pakistan sentiment is a very powerful political currency. And there's not really a desire to talk or reach an agreement with this. And in the past, it's really been the Pakistanis who have not been willing to talk. But uh, now it's really, or not substantively at least, uh, now it's really rolls are switched. And as you mentioned, Pakistan has engaged, used extraterritorial groups, uh, militant groups, to try to antagonize India or inflict death by a thousand cuts, as you mentioned. This strategy has been a product of Pakistan's paranoia towards India. They feel that they face a much bigger and more powerful military rival and a bigger, more powerful country generally. This is also what led to them developing nuclear weapons. It's very much backfired, though, because it's caused Pakistan to be associated with terrorism terrorism which has blown back on Pakistan in a very big way and it's ruined the diplomatic soft power which could allow them to raise the issue of Kashmir on which they actually have a point uh, in international fora. So I think unfortunately there's little that Pakistan can do, little that Imran Khan can do. My main concern now is that a war does not break out between India and Pakistan over the small portion of pa Kashmir that Pakistan controls. Because one thing that has not been noted is that the Modi government in, in the past has very clearly said that they're going to, quote-unquote, take back the part of Kashmir. And if that happens, there's a very real risk of a conventional war, which India will prefer, escalating into a nuclear war if Pakistan begins losing significant territory. Well, hopefully, in this case, uh, I mean, obviously, they're aligned with Pakistan, but I'm thinking, like, I mean... It's not going to come from here, so maybe some Chinese mediation. But um, on that note, Murtaza Hussein, have a good flight, brother. Thank you for enlightening us. It's extremely disturbing. Thank you for having me. But people need to know this. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Obviously, uh, links to all the ways you can find Murtaza on Twitter. Read all of his writing on The Intercept. Murtaza Hussein, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. Okay. All right, folks. It's always a pleasure too. Um, folks, uh, hit us with a super chat donation. That helps everything move along. If you're new here, click subscribe and we'll be back in about 15 minutes for the main show. We give you so much content. Richard Wolf is the guest tonight. See you soon.